Hey guys, my name is John Keel. I'm an assistant professor of emergency medicine and sports medicine at the UF College of Medicine here in Jacksonville. And I'm gonna talk about sports medicine emergencies. This is typically a 45 to 60 minute lecture, which I have trimmed down dramatically to meet my 15 minute window. And so I'm just gonna get started. Sternoclavicular dislocation is a uh, uncommonly encountered uh, orthopedic injury in sports medicine. So a lot of people are very unfamiliar with it but you need to be able to identify it clinically and uh, appropriately direct patients. Um, can be also seen in other non-sports related uh, trauma. Anterior would be the most common and more clinically identifiable. Posterior is a little more subtle, but is potentially catastrophic with mediastinal, esophageal, tracheal, etc. injuries. The presentation is gonna be some type of SC joint dysfunction, but they may have just shoulder pain. Uh, if you're lucky, you'll see a little deformity here at the sternoclavicular joint. This is an x-ray uh, of a SC dislocation, which is basically useless diagnostically. CAT scan is the imaging modality of choice, and you can see here a posterior sternoclavicular dislocation compressing the mediastinum. Um, what this patient's exact injuries were, I'm not sure, but this is certainly concerning. Ultrasound is also useful. On the patient's right, which is the left side of the screen, you can see an intact SC joint. And on the left, you see this posterior dislocation on ultrasound, very easy to identify. So this is an orthopedic emergency. Fortunately, anterior is not necessarily a surgical emergency, and you can try to reduce that in the ED, although these are often unstable, as opposed to posterior, which can kill up to three or 4% of the individuals who sustain these injuries and need to be seen by orthopedic surgery. And even when they take them to the OR, they're doing it with either CT surgery or vascular surgery backup, because this is a you know, big deal. Here we see an antero-inferior shoulder dislocation. I won't harp on these too much. These are very common and you definitely need to have some reduction techniques. Uh, there's multiple. I'm just gonna mention one here, which is called the Davos technique. I like it because you can do it on yourself if you're in the wilderness or out skiing or something. Um, but what you do is you basically raise the ipsilateral knee and hook your hands over that and then lean back slowly. In the ED, you could tape their hands um, so that they sort of can just slowly lay, lay back and, and let the muscles of the posterior shoulder fatigue and, and pull that thing back into, um, into the place. They need to be immobilized after their reduction. Here we're looking at a posterior elbow dislocation. This is the most common presentation um, and you will see these in your career. Reduction is primarily aimed at applying axial traction. You're trying to pull the uh, distal humerus, the olecranon, into the coronoid process uh, so that it's articulating appropriately, and then you apply some flexion there towards the end. When you're done here, they're going to put them in a long arm splint. Posterior hip dislocation would be the most common form of hip dislocation. These legs are going to be shortened and internally rotated. The treatment here is obviously reduction, and this is an important reduction which should be attempted on the field if you are confident in your diagnosis as time to reduction is associated with the development of avascular necrosis and the need for um, significant surgical intervention. The technique demonstrated here is what we call the Captain Morgan's technique where the guy on the left is using his knee as a fulcrum and the guy on the right is applying some posterior pressure to the iliac crest or the anterior superior iliac spine. This is a lateral patellar dislocation. These are very common among teenage athletes and very easy to treat. I note that this is not a knee dislocation, a very separate clinical entity. Uh, reduction is basically extension of the knee and medial pressure of the patella to get it back into the femoral notch. And it's very easy to reduce if it's uncomplicated. This is one example of where a knee immobilizer would be very appropriate. You wanna take away flexion and extension of that knee until they're able to follow up with uh, an orthopedic or sports medicine physician. Here you're seeing a couple types of ankle injuries. On the left is a bimal fracture dislocation. On the right is a subtalar dislocation. When you see these ankle injuries in the field, you will not know what, what the injury is exactly, although you might be able to sort of put it together by palpation. Uh, ideally, you're gonna try to reduce these if you have that level of confidence as uh, time to reduction matters so that they don't progress to open fracture dislocations that require uh, immediate uh, surgical washout. You wanna immobilize them in a posterior long leg splint and uh, stirrups. We're gonna talk about acute compartment syndrome quickly as this can definitely be seen in athletes, although the chronic version is, is probably more common. 
Uh, the definition of compartment syndrome uh, quantitatively is a little uh, disputed, I would say, but uh, in general, uh, normal would be less than 20 millimeters of mercury and abnormal would be greater than 30. And how you measure that, there are a couple ways to do it. Tibial shaft fractures by far are gonna be the most common. Uh, it is basically a clinical diagnosis where pain is out of proportion to exam, especially with passive stretch. These other neurological or vascular findings are uh, late findings, and you've missed the ball uh, if, if they have them. So when I say tibial fractures, I don't mean distal tibia fractures. I don't mean tibial plateau fractures pictured here. What I mean are mid-shaft tibia fractures. Okay, these are the ones that get compartment syndrome. Here's an illustration of what the compartments look like. The anterior compartment is by far the most common. Um, the biggest thing is having a good neurovascular exam of the distal leg, meaning the perineal nerves and the posterior tibial nerve and its branches on the plantar foot. Here's kind of an example of what a fasciotomy might look like in the lateral compartment preoperatively. Let's talk about cervical spine injuries. The first one is cervical uh, canal stenosis, which can be traumatic or atraumatic, um, but by definition, it's narrowing of that central canal um, you can see it congenitally, you can see with arthritis, they may have a positive Hoffman sign, they need x-rays and they need an MRI, and they're going to need some activity restrictions, they may need surgery, depending on how symptomatic they are, if they have any myelopathic findings. As far as return to play, they can probably do some sports, but they really shouldn't return to football or rugby or those kinds of sports. Although I will say that there are NFL players who are playing with this right now. Here is a normal CT scan and x-ray of the cervical spine. This would be a patient with a stinger that comes in or maybe doesn't come in at all, but uh, doesn't have any objective or structural disease. Um, so stingers are a transient weakness in one upper extremity, uh, which is usually a compression or traction kind of neuropraxia of C5-6. Uh, they're gonna have altered sensation and diminished strength. Um, they're gonna need MRI, maybe EMG, uh, if they're not getting better uh, or if they're having recurrent symptoms. Um, but as far as management, these players need to come out of the game, but if it happens in the first quarter, and at halftime, you reevaluate them, they could potentially go back in the game uh, if their strength is normal. Um, but if they're having recurrent symptoms or they're persistent, then it needs to be worked up. Here, you're seeing a spear tackling technique, which is dangerous and banned in football now because of this cervical cord neuropraxia, which is unlike a stinger, affects multiple extremities and often referred to as transient quadriplegia. So you can imagine what uh, these patients look like and how alarming their exam is gonna be on the sideline. They obviously need to be immobilized, sent to the hospital, and need an MRI and neurosurgical consultation. Um, they will not return to sports. Uh, and the primary treatment is prevention. This is the atlanoaxial joint, which can be unstable in certain diseases, such as Down syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, etc. Uh, these patients may have bowel and bladder dysfunction, um, abnormal sensation to the extremities, unsteady gait. They need an MRI and a surgical evaluation. And asymptomatic patients may be able to return to sport or play certain sports. This is often an uh, injury that is screened for in high-risk athletes such as Down syndrome. Here we're looking at a C1 burst fracture, uh, sometimes called a Jefferson fracture, which involves an axial load to the neck. They may or may not have neuro deficits. They need an MRI. Um, and they may be able to return to some sports. Here we're looking at a C2 uh, dens or odontoid fracture. Uh, also um, can involve a hangman's or pars fracture, usually involves hyperflexion. And then they're gonna have neck pain as well. They may not have neuro deficits and they probably do not return to sport. You wanna place all these patients on the sideline in a cervical collar and the spine board I would say is still SOP for the uh, sports medicine world. Nexus criteria is one of several ways to risk stratify these patients for decision making. So just remember Nexus criteria. There's also PCARN and Canadian C spine rules. So there's a lot of decision making rules that help you identify high risk uh, neck pain. If you can get these helmets off in the field, that is ideal. This is a lot harder to do in the hospital. Exercise associated collapse would be the most common cause of collapse associated with any type of endurance or sporting event. Usually it occurs at the end due to pooling of blood in the legs after they stop running. They might just start standing around. And this is why you hear the event management tell people to keep walking, keep walking. You'll hear that all the time. You got to exclude other causes, right? Like temperature, weight gain, sodium, um, glucose dysfunction. Um, but really they're going to have some type of witness collapse. They're going to be lightheaded, but they're going to be neuro intact. Okay. Despite their postural symptoms, 
uh, they will not be altered and that's the most important thing treatment is basically keep them walking uh, orally hydrate them if you have to lay them down and trim down them you can uh, but these patients usually bounce back pretty quick let's talk about heat related illness this is heat edema which is a self-limited uh, pathology no big deal heat cramps the decision is always whether they need oral or iv hydration whatever you decide make sure that it's isotonic right so gatorade or salt tablets with their water but not just water uh, you potentially can make the electrolyte dysfunction worse and just make the cramping worse heat exhaustion is similar to exercise associated collapse they're hyperthermic they feel bad but they are not altered um, you know cool them get them out of the heat and if they're not improving they need to go to the hospital or if they develop any neurological dysfunction of course heat syncope is also self-limited you just have to consider other causes of syncope um, but again, move the, remove them from the heat, elevate their legs, hydrate them, cool them, and then you'll have to decide if they need to go to the hospital. Heat stroke is a very different beast. Uh, it is the end spectrum of you know, heat illness in a real emergency. People die, a third of people die even when treated appropriately. And there's some, been some very high profile uh, heat stroke deaths in the country over the last decade or two. So it's a very uh, popular topic in sports medicine. Uh, by definition, they're hyperthermic and altered okay what altered or what neuro dysfunction means is a lot of things but just remember hyperthermic and altered mental status and you'll be able to identify heat stroke treatment is immediately get them out of the heat and begin cooling cold water immersion is the standard of care if you don't have that cool them however you can here are two of the better options one is the cold water immersion on the left on the right you see arm immersion therapy which is also very effective at cooling your core temperature um, it would be hard for an altered patient to be able to do this, but in other patients, this is an effective way to re reduce their core temperature. So these patients all need to go to the hospital. There's no question about it. Um, the goal is to get their core temp down to 39. And when you get there, you gotta slow down because you'll overcorrect and make them hypothermic. Uh, the best way is cold water immersion, but you know, putting ice packs in their groin, spraying cold water, using a fan, right, is very effective. Um, you can do a lavage, cold water lavage in basically any orifice, but I would say orogastric or Foley would be the most common. Uh, ECMO would sort of be the end of spectrum of that therapy if, if you thought they had a chance at survival. And you do not want to give them antipyretics, you do not give them dantrolene, okay? These patients go to the ICU, they develop a lot of end organ dysfunction and, and are at high risk for decompensation. Um, whether they go back to play, there's no clear guidelines on that. Um, what I would say is, as an example, we had a heat stroke patient in my uh, army annual training a couple of years ago who was seizing in the field, got flown by the medevac team to the hospital, um, was treated appropriately, did well, um, survived neurologically intact, and he was discharged from the military after that experience. Exercise associated hyponatremia is something else that you should be looking out for. Uh, by definition, it occurs within 24 hours of the event or activity. These patients may be euvolemic or hypovolemic, uh, hypervolemic, which is often dilutional if they drink too much water and not enough electrolyte solution. Uh, in addition to sports, you can see this in training events, hiking. So there's a lot of risk factors here uh, or risky activities. Mild is going to be nonspecific. Um, the, note the weight gain that is common, which is why uh, in a lot of these events, you're measuring people's weight before and after. But more severe is you know neurological dysfunction cerebral edema pulmonary edema this is a big deal right if you have this you need to give them hypertonic saline and you have to have thought this through um, typically this is going to be iv if they're awake enough to drink oral that's fine um, and when you send them to the hospital make sure that you communicate your concern to the ed staff most people freak out over hypertonic saline but just remember an acute decrease in serum sodium such as during an endurance event can be treated with an acute increase uh, by hypertonic saline. These patients have not had a chance to um, homogenize the low sodium and it is easy to treat uh, safely with hypertonic saline. But the treatment of choice is don't drink too much water.